was the first year of the first international karate championships uh, held in Long Beach. And my job was to make sure that Bruce Lee, uh, you know, at Parker gave me a certain amount of money to make sure he, he ate properly <laughs> and make sure he got back to the hotel room, sort of like his host. And I met him then and uh, grew to really like his personality and uh, we became very close friends. Uh, when Bruce arrived uh, in the United States, uh, he had the training in Wu style Tai Chi, which sometimes in Hong Kong they call it Unga. And he had the course training uh, in Western boxing. He had uh, training in, in fencing from his brother. Uh, that's uh, Epe, that goes from toe to head. Uh, he had training, obviously, in Wing Chun. And the other area was the, the training he had received in the, they call it Buck Pie, or it's a Tom Toy. He knew 12 sets in Tom Toy. And then I uh, believe he traded with a Choi Lee Fat Man. So those were the arts that Bruce uh, brought into the United uh, States. What uh, Bruce did, as, as, a, as a relay to me, that uh, he could never learn from the top man. Because in those days, uh, Kung Fu practitioners were quite prejudiced, and they didn't usually share the knowledge with other people from other styles. So what Bruce did, he knew that. So what he did would go to the second or the third or fourth man in the system and say, well, look at the, how would you like to learn Wing Chun? And I'll trade you uh, my Wing Chun knowledge for your praying mantis. Let's say it's Northern praying mantis. And that's what he did, because he knew that the head structure wouldn't teach him. So he did that with, in Southern mantis. Southern mantis, I, I believe he, he trained straight with, with the man. But a lot of the styles that he trained in Chinese Kung Fu, the way he picked it up, with, he would uh, exchange the knowledge of Wing Chun for different Chinese, different styles. And of course, it was between him and the person he traded with. So he usually picked the second or third or fourth or fifth man within the hierarchy or the, of the top five in each uh, Kung Fu system. And then uh, as he approached that, he worked obviously uh, with a lot of uh, Western boxers. Uh, a lot of his students were sort of street type um, fighters. He worked with various different uh, wrestlers and judo men and jiu-jitsu men and slowly went away from uh, the traditional or the classical way of uh, training in Kung Fu. And he sort of changed the methods. In other words, uh, he did away with the, uh, the classical uh, traditional ways of forms. But uh, I think he still kept the forms, but he separated between what was the forms and what was the, the way he wanted to train for, for martial art. He referred to the forms as uh, martial art uh, gymnastics. And uh, that's, that's the first part that you would see, because when I first learned under Bruce, uh, he was teaching me sets. For the first six months of my training, I learned sets. And he, I, I was learning a set in uh, Northern Mantis, and uh, the first set in, in Wing Chun, and a, a little style, a little first part of uh, the Wu system, uh, Tai Chi Chuan. And then within about three to six months, it's hard to uh, go back in my memory right now, but he said that's not where it was at. And he just stopped, completely stopped uh, teaching me that and went into this, uh, what I call his way of thinking, you know, his way of training. Uh, instead of doing, uh, like, like in other words, the, the Wing Chun dummy, for an example, and I think Bruce only knew from 1 to 60, I believe, and he wanted to learn the rest of the Wing Chun dummy, and at that time he did not know, and he, I think he went back to Hong Kong and tried to learn it, but somehow reason he could not. So he felt that the first uh, 1 to 60 was the very important. Instead of teach, training from 1 to 60, he would take a portion of that one to 60 and train that thing over and over and over and over again. That was a, that's the way he taught. And then he came to a, a point where he started not even follow the prescribed method on the Wing Chun dummy. He just started to freelance it. And that's what he did with the forms. He just took a section of the form and shadow box it, pretty much like a, uh, a Muay Thai fighter would do. He would shadow box the movements, right? Or, or like a Western boxer would, would shadow box. And he'd take, he would take it out of the form uh, analyze it, investigate it, and say, no, that's not the way you would actually do it in combat. I'll change it a little bit. And probably, I, I'm safe to say, he was probably very uh, much criticized during that time period. Absorb what is useful concept is, is just something that uh, he felt that every individual was different. Therefore, he couldn't really follow his instructor, per se. 
So realizing that you couldn't follow his instructor, he had to find out what worked for him. But of course you have a, a base system. And so his interpretation is that you could say unite Wing Chun and take and flow right into Jiu Jitsu and go from Jiu Jitsu into Western boxing and Western boxing out to Savat or out to Muay Thai and go back and in and out of uh, various disciplines. This was his uh, idea and he seemed to, uh, as people said at that time, get away with it. But uh, the, a traditionalist might frown on that because that's not the accepted way. There are some people that when you study with them, they, if, whatever the style is, they want you to say strictly Chole Fat, or let's say Chole Fat, for instance. Okay, but his concept was that, that you didn't have to. You could flow from Choi Fat into Wing Chun if you knew how to do it. You can flow, flow from Choi Fat into Western boxing hands. Uh, you can, from Western boxing hands, you can flow into Jiu Jitsu. You can flow into grappling. So absorb what is useful is that, uh, identically what he's trying to say is it's from a book called the, uh, the Art of War, Sun Ji. He says, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add specifically, uh, what works for you. So that's basically the, uh, the philosophy behind absorb what is useful. Transcending technique is many ways you could do this, but uh, uh, the techniques really aren't that important. What makes a technique, uh, in my opinion, is the timing, the rhythm, okay? uh, your personal attributes, like your agility, uh, your balance, your coordination, dexterity, stamina, strength for that certain time period. Uh, the technique has to fit the individual. Technique has to fit motion, both your motion and the opponent that you're, that you're flowing with. That's the important part about technique. So attributes, according to Bruce, were probably more important than technique. Developing uh, speed or stamina or strength, those were attributes that you do use in combat. And that's, I think, what he was trying to say there, that the, you've got to transcend the technique, both physically and mentally. Having no limitation as a limitation, the philosophy behind that is that if you are trained in a particular martial art, which, which is called this, a, a Japanese style, they might see something uh, in another style that they like, let's say another Chinese style. But because of the, uh, the curriculum, they stay within the boundaries, so therefore it limits what he can use. As having no limitation is your limit. He's using no limit. The boundaries within the uh, Western boxing, let's say that's a boundary because you're boxing, you, you're strictly using your, your, your hands. You, you're not really using your knee, you're not using your elbow, so it is limited. Uh, wrestling, for the most part, unless it's a, uh, professional wrestling, you're not allowed to use the elbow, or bite, and gouge. So you're limited because that gives you a, a kind of a, a structure to work with. Uh, judo is very, very good art. They, they throw well, they choke well, they strangle well, they arm bar, they leg bar, but there is no punching, so that's limit. So he's trying to say using no limitation as styles do limit to a certain degree. Bruce said that to transcend technique, it has to punch. It has to kick. You don't punch. It punches. It kicks. It elbows. It knees. It head smashes. All right? It does everything. It grapples. It locks. It chokes. It strangles. It was the transcending of self. You don't know how you hit. It hit. It hit, 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 hit by itself without even a conscious effort. That's what he's talking about, that the it. So he's transcending the physical. He told me once, well, I don't know if it's true or not. He said that he could see himself, if there was a person he's fighting, that he never fought the battle from here. He fought the battle from here, and he could see himself and the opponent. He says, I says, let me get this straight now. You mean your opponent's here, and you're here, and you're not here watching this guy? He says, yes, I'm watching from here. So he had that saying, and I think it's in one of his sayings, he says, be like a wooden uh, doll. It has no ego. It just moves like a wooden dog because you move. So he can observe it. Uh, like he said, you can observe things better from a third person. Of thought clearly. Like it's, it's uh, when I train uh, fighters, uh, I couldn't understand why they couldn't see the opening <laughs> when they were sparring, right? And why they didn't cover this. Thing. But when you get in there, 
you can't see the opening. You could see it from the third person, and that's where Bruce was saying he was seeing it. For a good example, when I played football, uh, if I made a good run, uh, it was so effortless. When you're up there in the stadium, you, you can see the openings where he should have ran left and right. But when you're running with the ball, you can't see the opening sometimes. Right? Your coach from the bench can see it, and your scout up there in the stadium can see where you should have ran left or right, or should, you should have put on a speed, or should you stop short and cut to the left or to the right. But when you're in the heat of it, you really can't see it. Right? That's uh, what he's saying, that he sees it from a third person. Therefore, he can see the openings. That's why a trainer has to tell his boxer or his fighter when he comes back to the corner, he says, loop with the overhead. He's dropping his hands because sometimes he's so occupied in trying to defeat his opponent, he can't see it because he's not a, he's not a wooden doll. It's, it was a, it, you have to be formless, as he should tell us. And that's, I think, what he's trying to say. It, it does it because he's no longer in the body. What John Fun was, uh, was basically, I think its base system was probably Wing Chun. And thrown in with uh, ideas that he, he picked from uh, Savat, uh, Muay Thai, as he saw it, as he observed. Uh, thrown in with various different Gong Fu systems and Western boxing with jiu-jitsu and different things he had learned from different grappling arts from China. And that's the basis of, uh, uh, of John Fan. The liberation of John Fan, uh, we get into now what we call Jeet Kune Do. For an example, uh, to, to exp expand on what Jeet Kune Do is, Jeet Kune Do is a very personal thing. Therefore, it is not really a, a product. It, rather, it's a process. It's a process of becoming and you're constantly changing. The only thing you can be uh, sure about uh, time is it's, it's constantly changing, even the ideas, okay? So Jeet Kune Do, for an example, if I had one student, he might incorporate only 20%, let's say, Western boxing, as another student would, might really like it, so he'll use 80% Western boxing. Another person might incorporate 100% Muay Thai. Another person might not like the training, so he might incorporate 10. That's strictly up to him. A person might incorporate grappling. Let's say three, there's three persons. One person might not incorporate any of it. Another person uh, would incorporate maybe 10%, another person 15 another person maybe 80% of it. But what is important that he is exposed to that particular discipline. The way I'm moving now, I use the discipline uh, to develop attributes. That's the, the, the key thing. Uh, because I believe, like, Tai Chi Chuan, for an example, it has a, a lot of good uh, characteristics that, uh, that, that I like. You know, it sort of calms the system down, and uh, it has balance, it promotes balance, and it has good body control when you, when you do it. Muay Thai, the advantage I think there is that they are really, as far as conditioning uh, in the martial art, I consider them to be the most highly conditioned martial artists out there. So uh, I like to incorporate that aspect of it. I lead my students to say, well, do they like um, the training in Muay Thai better than they like the training in Bondo or so on? I allow my students to choose what they like, what they want to do, and what art that they want to uh, gravitate to. And I think this is important. Just as uh, when people go through public school, you should give them a base, a base study course but you allow them after they come out to pick what they want, what, what they want uh, to concentrate on music more or art or on math or on science. So Jeet Kune Do is, is it's just the same thing. You concentrate on your effort. A Jeet Kune Do technique can be a, a boxer's left jab. It could be a boxer's left hook. It could be a boxer's uppercut. And it could be a cross. It could be a Muay Thai kick on the thigh. It could be an elbow from Muay Thai. It could be a knee from Muay Thai. It could be a wrist lock from jiu-jitsu or Aikido. It's whatever what works. So a Jeet Kune Do technique, there, you can't really classify a Jeet Kune Do technique. And the way of the, uh, in the realm that Bruce had it, it's absorbing what is useful for you. Since it is not a style, we use maybe certain disciplines 
to get certain attributes, to develop certain things. So you, there is no Jeet Kune Do technique as per se, as the way he founded the, the idea. Okay? Many people re, refer to it as a style, but it's not a style, because it's not a, a style as a product. And as he used to tell me, it is a process. It's just a process of constant growth. And what is Jeet Kune Do for you now might not be Jeet Kune Do for you six years down the line because of age, because of time, a factor of training and things of that nature. Jeet Kune Do now, uh, since there's a lot of disciples that, uh, that came from Bruce, and there's a, I have a lot of students, each is uh, developing it uh, in the way that they think it should be developed. Some people don't want to come out. They want to stay in the garage and, and teach one or two or three students. That's fine, too. Others want to promote it more, uh, get it into the, the limelight a little bit more, and that's fine, too. Uh, like, for an example, Daniel Lee. He teaches uh, Jeet Kune Do, but his main thrust is Tai Chi Tuan. He promotes it through Tai Chi Tuan. As Richard Bustillo is more into uh, Western boxing, he's more into kickboxing. He takes that aspect of Jeet Kune Do and tries to push that aspect. Uh, Larry Hartzell is more into uh, what we call Filipino Dumog, which is grappling, uh, or Layog, which is uh, another form of Filipino grappling, and mixing in with a uh, little Chinese uh, chin out here and there, and Western wrestling, and some things from Jiu Jitsu, and some things from Aikido that, that he's uh, integrated for himself. So, Ji Kun Do, the only worry uh, that I have is that some of these people might uh, lead their disciples down one particular path and say, this is Ji Kun Do, and my Ji Kun Do is the way Bruce Widow had it. Now, then my person might say, no, this is, it's in the kickboxing, and it's in the Thai boxing, and it's in the wrestling. This is the way Bruce would have had it, okay? Uh, that's the only danger that, that I see. Bruce did uh, hand out certain techniques, but they were used to illustrate a certain point when you might use this at a particular range. And the, the thing that he used to tell me, there are certain weapons that are good for certain ranges. Like a grenade, you wouldn't use it five feet away from you. You might use a dagger. Uh, a staff, you might use it for a little bit shorter distance. A grenade would be good maybe if there's a machine gun nest out there 50 yards, and that would be the time to use it. There are certain techniques that are good for certain circumstances. Once a man crashes in and he's in, in uh, grappling range, you should use it. So there are some people who don't believe in the grappling range, but if you look at any professional boxing match or kickboxing match, they just, they, within two to three kicks or three or five punches, they're already in clinching range. So you should have uh, a grappling art. You can't afford not to learn it. Okay? Some people say, well, I, I'll finish it all in kicking range. I'll finish it all. So I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to say is that uh, Every system or discipline has its time and place. Uh, for an example, Bruce Hussey asked me, he said, Dan, what's the best way of travel? I says, uh, 747, jet, United Airlines, possibly. He says, well, if you're going across the street, the jet wouldn't be very much of use, would it? If you wanted to go two or three blocks, maybe a bicycle might be better than a car. And if you're in the jungles of Amazon, he says, uh, the Porsche that McQueen drives isn't any good. <laughs> because they can't use it under that environment. 